The sunlight's so nice this morning. Hello, I am Shelby. I am a potter that is based in Australia. Welcome to my first ever Q&A video. Usually when I see Q&A videos, someone sits here and they have their phone or something and they read the questions out but I'm actually a little bit behind on my work for this week and this is the first YouTube where I'm filming it the same day that I'm posting it so we're, we're working with some really like tight time frames today and so instead I thought I might answer your questions whilst I'm getting the work done for the end of the week. I'm actually going to answer the first question before I get into it because it's got to do with the actual studio and whether I'm liking it, how's it going, is it finished? But I also wanted to say that in this video, I am making three special announcements. I've been sharing little sneaks of them on Instagram and things like that. I'm just excited to share them with you. Okay, so the first question was actually, is your studio finished? If not, how much is left? And I also got a comment on the YouTube community post asking, am I liking the new digs? So I'm going to answer that together. I love it so so much this space has been a total game changer the level of work i've been able to create i've been able to really upscale the amount i can make and also be able to experiment and explore a whole lot more be a lot more organized i can have designated space for packing orders without having to pack down the work that i've just started working on it's been incredible the organization the way it makes your brain so much clearer on what you need to do and what you've got to achieve has just made me so much more efficient in what i'm doing and a lot more enjoyable because the space also stays tidier and cleaner and has some order to it so overall i i wish i could have done this sooner um finances didn't allow me to do this sooner but I am so relieved to be in here and it just feels like an inspiration den. I love being in here more than my own house. Like it's, <laughs> it's just stunning in here and I am just so grateful for your support over the years to allow me to actually be in here right now and continue making work and be able to make more work for you to enjoy in your houses as well. As for is it finished? <laughs> Not quite. Not quite. There are a few things that I still need to do that have been uh, delayed because they're not necessarily a priority, but they'll just finish off the space. But also because I haven't really figured out what I want to do yet. So the first thing is actually storage for the molds. The molds are still in the old space and I haven't quite figured out how I want to work out the shelving units for those to keep them organized. I have this space where I want to put them but there's also a window there and I'm like not sure how to configure it so I still get that beautiful light in the later afternoon. Where I'm standing right now there's a lot of space. Uh, I've just finished upcycling a second hand table for another workspace bench. Uh, so now I have two tables and the bench behind me, but I also want a sort of smaller table here that also doubles as my sort of market event table that I can pack down. And um, this should serve as sort of like a packing table or a content filming table. So I'm hoping to get something for here. I want shelves behind the couch here. I'd love to have a gallery wall or shelves or something up there to, to fill that space up but still keep it bright and colourful. And the last thing I wanted to do is build a kitchenette section where we can wash up the tools and have running water uh, because at the moment we're still going outside to get the water which is fine, like that's fine. I mean people have to walk further distances for water but uh, it would just be nice to have everything in the one space. Some more storage just for the really annoying things to store, like brooms, mops. Storage for all my packing stuff because it's very ugly. What would be the perfect mystery mold or what is a piece that you sort of hope to find? Really early on I always talked about hopefully trying to find a really cool novelty teapot. I just find novelty teapots are the funniest things ever, but they're kind of funky little teapots that look like a different object, like they kind of resemble a teapot. So for example, I've seen novelty teapots where it's like, <laughs> it looks like a dancing pig and the spout is like the arm and then the like leg is curling around to be the handle. That is my dream mystery mold, but aside from that anything that's kind of 
got a really kitschy randomness to it like cow milk jug there was the mushroom butter dish i thought that was so epic i really just like pieces that just make me think in a different way about pottery but also play on nostalgia and a retro decor of yesteryear so that is my dream so what is your favorite mammal i would say that the wombat the wombat is probably my favorite they are one of the only species they are the only species that poop squares <laughs> you know what i actually really love cockers too because they just like they just feel like joy to so say i like cockers because they smile a lot and so do i because may we see your brushes i will show you my my top five who am i missing oh maybe this is only going to be a top four these are my top four so we have a big flat hang on i do have a top five it just made me think of it Okay, so we'll start with the biggest and go to the smallest. This guy I actually got when I was studying ceramics. This one's fabulous for glazing. It is the perfect glaze brush. It's nice and soft. It doesn't leave bristles. It doesn't leave brush strokes. It goes on so smooth. These are called Haki, Haki brushes. This one that I started with. This one's good for flat area for underglaze. I find that these sort of brushes are a lot better for underglaze than something like this because it really moves the underglaze exactly where I want it. And number six, um, Mikado. This one is a also a flat sort of square shape, but that's more for my smaller areas where I want to get a lot of coverage, like my eyes. Sometimes flower shapes and stuff like that I use this one for. This one's a size 4. Again, Mikador. This one is probably, I don't use it a lot for a lot of things, but for what I use it for, it's fabulous. This one gets used for really fine lines. Again, I use this for line work like the arms. And then my fifth and probably the most used in my whole paintbrush pot is the fine liner. So this is what a lot of my videos I use. You actually get a finer line from this one, but if you're doing a smaller detail piece, this probably this isn't the most effective, whereas this one's a bit more effective. This one is a 5-0 Zen. What was your first ever pottery creation? And I'm gonna humble myself a little bit <laughs> and also share a really nice thing that you should do as an artist is to always keep one artwork from every sort of progression you make in your artist style and career because they are fabulous things to look back on and to see how far you've grown. The first artwork I ever made were these tiny <laughs> little uh, vases and pinch pots on the pottery wheel. That's how I started, I was a wheel thrower. I've always done the native floral stuff. So that is one of the first ones I ever threw, ever had fired. <laughs> I can feel the wobbles and the bumps and even the application of my underglaze, how far that's changed. This is my very first koala. Please be kind. This one's a little bit cursed, but very cute because it's the original. And it's actually the one I use to make the molds for the koalas today. So I fell in love with this shape so much. <laughs> they are so funny looking to me and even like the color of the clay like I've changed clay bodies so many times you can see the development of that as well are you going to make more frogs always I love frogs I would actually love to make like an Australian species of frog as a pot I do have some right here that I need to clean up and glaze and there's a lot of other ones that are waiting to be glaze fired but yeah they're coming would you ever make a ceramic pin or ceramic button I love this question because an accident happened this week where a jar accidentally combusted and <laughs> smashed the little top the little like handle for the jar lid looked perfect as a button it was adorable thinking how cute it would be to make a series of buttons that is now something that I do actually want to make because it looks gorgeous as for the pins the glues just don't know if I trust them enough to make the pins and how I would actually go about putting the findings on the back or constructing it in a way that it will last a long time all right the next set of questions I had were to do with tips for beginners and that you're feeling nervous for your first class and I just wanted to say I totally understand why you're feeling nervous I was nervous to first start 
but please don't be. It is a wonderful medium and we all have a voice with this medium and we all have some beautiful ideas that we can bring to life. My number one tip for people that ask how to start is to actually do a class or a workshop where they can afford it. The reason for that is because a lot of the workshops and classes will teach you a really great fundamental understanding of clay and how it works, the safety behind it, and how to glaze and get your work ready for kiln firing so that it doesn't wreck other works in the kiln, it doesn't wreck the kiln furniture, but also so that you're looking after yourself at home or in your studio where you're practicing your clay work and just your understanding of how the clay works so that you can get a better result. And if you can't afford to go to a workshop, I highly recommend searching people up on YouTube, searching different clay bodies, finding people on Instagram, even TikTok is a really great resource. You can't get access to a workshop or a class to buy a bag of clay and find some cheap little tools at the op shop like a rolling pin, forks, little needle tools, even like toothpicks can work great. And just grab those and have a clay. At the end of the day, clay is just mud <laughs> and you can just sculpt it however you like and you could do whatever you want with it and that is totally fine. It's not as daunting as you think it is. I wouldn't get anything fancy just in case you don't end up liking it. And that goes for kilns as well. I would only invest in a kiln if you know you're really gonna take this seriously and continue doing it. I would look into your local area and see if there's any potters that have a kiln so that you can ask them and see if they'll hire out a little spot on their kiln shelf. Just make sure that the kiln firing that they do is the same as the clay body that you're using. Okay, for the last piece of advice I'm, oh <laughs> I'm getting a cuddle give it a go don't be afraid to play and just have fun literally have fun with it that question actually leads me to a really good segue to the first announcement of this video and that is I am going to be attending Craft Lab 2023. Some of you might already know this if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, but I am going to be doing Craft Lab. So Craft Lab is happening in my hometown or home city of Ballarat, which is about an hour, hour and a half from Melbourne in Victoria, Australia. And it is a week long festival in our town that coincides with Heritage Festival. A bunch of craft practitioners are coming into this one building and we each have our own little booth and we're going to be doing live demonstrations, live sort of workshop -y type things and you're able to come in and ask us questions, learn a bit about our craft and also I will have some pieces for sale there. So I'm really excited about it. Can you hear my voice? As part of it, I'll be running a workshop of pick and paint your own mystery mold. You'll get to pick a mystery mold. Some of them I haven't even revealed on here yet and you'll get to pour it, you'll get to open it up and have the surprise, and then you'll get to paint it in this workshop. And I hope that you really, really like it because I really worked hard on it. But as for the actual craft lab, I'm going to be there on the 20th and 21st of May, so the Saturday and Sunday, and then the following weekend on the 27th, 28th of May, I am going to be there so that you can come meet, greet, say hello, also come ask me questions about pottery, come ask me questions about slip casting. I'm going to be doing live slip casting and there's going to be other practitioners there from like jewelry makers, upholsterers, leather workers. I think that's it for craft lab but that's it. That's announcement number one. Did you study ceramics or another degree? It's always nice to know where people began. Most of my learning has been self-taught but I did actually do a course on pottery at university. I actually have a bachelor degree in social work and was working as a social worker before I took this full time. My plan with social work was actually to work in art therapy from my own experience of having a chronic illness of cancer. That is a long story um, and a very interesting one which I'm happy to do in another Q&A or even a story time but I am a cancer survivor. So I decided to do social work so that I could give back and I found a big thing during my journey, which is when I started playing with air dry clay mediums was actually being able to find a craft that took my mind off of everything. And being able to sculpt and have control over a medium where I didn't have control in my own personal health and life uh, and everything that was happening to me was life changing. It has a very soft spot in my heart and the fact that I get to do this every day and get to 
play with clay every day is just such a blessing and the fact that I'm here is such a blessing. Part of that was to become an art therapist so I actually did a semester of ceramics pottery as part of my uni degree at the University of Sydney. I actually moved to Sydney for my degree and it was fabulous. I loved it so much because the semester is about seven weeks each week was something new so we did hand building, wheel throwing, kiln like there was a whole week on just kilns it was awesome glazing under glazing and then raku we did a raku firing I got a really good fundamental understanding but i didn't learn slip casting not many people talked about it because there's a lot of stigma around slip casting which could be a whole nother video where i rant about that but uh, I find a lot of potters and people in particular I get this comment a lot and it drives me bananas is people treating slip casting like a lesser medium and then it's lesser handmade and it's lesser valuable because it's in a mold. I actually got into slip casting because when I started doing pottery I was like I love this this is so fun I want to keep doing this and I want to be able to sell stuff. You know what I think there is a question that I can relate this back to. Where did you first start selling your ceramics and was it physical or online? When I first started I applied for markets, I applied for events, I applied for wholesale, I tried contacting stockists and no one wanted my work. <laughs> no one. I got rejected from so many markets. I got rejected from so many stores. I mean, the first koala was pretty creepy, but they got like instantly better after that. I got rejected everywhere. I continued to get rejected for years. So insert Instagram being amazing here because I then took to Instagram and started posting my creations on there back when it was just sort of your photos. I just started connecting with people, promoting my work on there and set up an Etsy store. So Etsy was really great to start off because you get a lot of people that search and search engine for specific things. So they were finding my work that way and also just really working hard on my Instagram presence, collaborating with other makers, doing giveaways, really brought in my sales on the Etsy platform. I then, as I said, continued to apply for markets and still got rejected. So if you're getting rejected from markets, please do not let that discourage you. But from Etsy, I found that the fees were astronomical and I had built a very big reputation for myself online already and was selling out restocks. So I made the move to my own website just because the fees were so much lower and I didn't necessarily need the traffic from the search engine that Etsy was providing anymore because I was already getting my own customers from social media. As for this question, I get asked a lot, but I didn't get asked this time, why did I do slip casting? Why did I choose slip casting? I didn't learn at uni. Why is that a thing? It's because when I was looking at selling my work, I was really invested and interested in doing a wholesale product. So keeping something that was predictable, the same size, the same energy, but it had a really quirky handmadeness to it was to do a mold. So I learned about slip casting molds and studied it and made my first really rough slip casting mold so that I could keep my little koala shapes all the sort of similar, same height, size, width, everything so that I could pitch like a brochure to people and be like this is what you can order this is what price each one is they're generally this size x y and z and this they'll come with a various bouquet of flowers different personalities on their faces uh, but that's how I got into slip casting to keep things consistent I didn't take any of the workload out uh, people think that they're easier than hand fielding and wheel throwing and in a way they kind of are but they are the same workload to make, they just keep them consistent. I then did get a few stockers that I absolutely adored, but as things blew up even more, I couldn't upkeep wholesale with restocks and having enough for the online shop as well. Do you ever sell your pieces? Yes. Sorry, it gets a little bit tricky because I do one restock and it generally sells out on the day I do the restock, but I do announce that on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok ghosts me when I announce a restock and so does YouTube. So I'm really sorry if you don't see those announcements, it's actually a social media platform half the time not showing you that. I was doing restocks once a month. I've had to pause restocks for a little while because of the announcement at the end of this video. I will be doing restocks online again after this event, but for the meantime, I've postponed that so I can make enough work for this event that I'm attending. There is a link to my website on my YouTube, but it's shelbysherrett.com.au. Where do you get your molds from? As a beginner, I just want a small lot. A lot of the time, the molds get sold as bulk lots, like people are clearing out a whole shed worth. I don't even have a space for a whole shed worth 
it's really tricky because you can't really find individual molds. I would suggest joining some mold groups on Facebook actually because there are some and I know that there's a group called Slip Casting Fundamentals on Facebook which is a US based group and I often see molds for sale on that. There's also a Australian based one which is called I think it's like Molds and Bisque for Sale Australia. People just list the molds they don't want and then you can pick and choose and often they can post them to you. eBay is great for a few molds and also pottery shops. Fly shops still sell molds. They're not vintage molds and they're not like what I've got. Uh, but you can get like teapots, mugs, plates, things like that just to get you started and to get you trying it and you can get the slip straight from them. Uh, the next question was would you ever do more mystery molds? <laughs> yes, <laughs> always. I still have so many to do and this leads me to my second announcement of the video. But if I run out of the ones I have now, I, I just really love doing this. I just find it really fun. I love doing my own work and my own original designs and establishing my own design works and dream works. The mystery molds are so fun. It's like thrift shopping where you see a cool vintage collectible piece, but you get to like put your own spin on it and get to fire it and see the finished results. So the fact that you all love it too makes it more encouraging for me to keep doing it. At this point in time, asking that question, I don't see me ever not doing them. That question is an excellent segue to the second announcement and I wanted to announce that the long awaited mystery mold series is coming back. <laughs> Happy dances all around. I am so so excited. I took a really long break. I would like to thank you for being patient with me and being understanding with me and enjoying the other content pieces that I've been making. But I needed that break to move into here to also just have a moment of pause and so that I didn't burn out and absolutely hate doing them. So I just wanted to thank you for your patience with that. They will actually be returning in June. So it's currently May right now, and you're probably wondering what am I gonna do for the rest of the May videos, the weekly videos, but that'll be at the end of the video again. As for how often I'll be doing them, I am actually going to only be doing two a month, one every second week. As much as I would love to do one every week like I was doing, I found that I was getting really burnt out and really stressed to get the pieces done every week. You all loved Smash or Pass so much. Some of you didn't so much, but uh, that was a very, very small minority. The response I got just even from YouTube views, like seeing the engagement and the views from that showed me that you guys really liked that. And I didn't expect that. I thought you loved the creative process just as much, but yeah, there was a very big response for that. Because that's four modes every video, I don't have as much capacity to do that because otherwise we'll work through them so, so fast and I won't have as much time to like catch up with the making of them. For that series, I'm gonna be doing one a month. And then as for the last video of every month or however it works out, that last video will be just a random video. So that might just be a vlog, a studio vlog, Q&A video like today, or it might be like a specific question video. For example, give us a rundown of your kiln. Studio tour. That just gives it the content a bit of balance. It just means that you get a diverse range of content as well. How do you decide what to focus on and prioritize? Since moving into the studio and having the organization, it is a lot easier to figure out what I'm gonna be doing. At the start of the month, what I do now is I actually write a plan of what we're going to make, so the studio assistant and I, and how many pieces we're gonna make of each thing, how many molds we need to pour, and what the designs are gonna be for those pieces and write down how many times we need to pour each mold to get that number of pieces and how much time we kind of need to paint it to make it finished. From there, the day kind of alters and changes depending on what we finish and what gets done. Every day is sort of different. Generally, the day will start off by pouring the molds. After that, we will clean up some of the pieces like what I'm doing right now and get them ready for painting and then we'll paint some of the pieces with either underglaze or glaze. The end of the day is usually when I unpack and pack the kiln up for the next day. As for the YouTube content and my content for social media, I kind of just film that throughout the week. Like I just sort of have a plan of what kind of videos I want to make and what sort of things people are interested in and I will just do them in between all the other jobs. 
Like for example, this week we were painting stuff and whilst um, we were painting stuff, I went and filmed a few of the pieces that I was painting. I'm also currently filming some vlogs. So I set the camera up and whilst I was just doing what I'm doing now, I filmed that. I had a comment about like, is it stressful doing the level of content I'm doing? Sometimes it is when I really just wanna be in the zone and focused on what I'm doing and adding a camera and moving the camera around to film myself in my studio can be really exhausting. So on those days, I just focus on what I'm doing. I just do it. I don't film any content and I just allow that to be my designated day or a couple of days where I don't film anything and it's just me in my element. With that said, I don't really find content making that stressful only because I have been able to grow and learn so much over the past couple of years. I'm already doing this. What you see in the video is just, I'm doing what I usually do, but the camera's looking at it at the same time. Everything could be content, everything can be content, but I choose specific things each week that I prioritize as that specific content piece so that I don't get swept up into, oh, I should be filming this, I should be filming this. We're filming this this week, and these are gonna be the pieces that I'm not filming that are just for me to be in my zone and to be in my artistic fun space. You wanna know where I get my clothes from? <laughs> Taken a while to develop my style. Like, if you look back at the first mystery molds, I was wearing, like, footy shorts and a gross jumper. So, thank you so much, that's such a nice compliment. Right now, I'm wearing a pair of overalls I bought from Retro Star in Melbourne when I was in year nine. <laughs> and I still fit into them. I wear them a lot. Um, and this top's actually from Ganda. I do a few pieces from Ganda. Majority of my stuff is actually from Princess Highway and they collaborated with me by gifting me a lot of pieces, but like pieces that I love and adore. Majority of the pieces you comment on are the ones from Princess Highway. Another one is Nine Lives Bazaar, which is a uh, Australian small business. They feature a beautiful, sustainable fabric that is printed with gorgeous, bold florals and bold prints that are inspired by the 70s yesteryears and they are stunning. I also have a few pieces from Daughters of India, which do these beautiful hand block printed dresses, tops. They are light, flowy, non-clingy pieces. And if you get annoyed at fabric clinging to your body and you're in a sort of warmer climate, they are so lightweight and lovely to wear. I also get a lot of tops from Arnhem Clothing. They are really stunning. Oh, dresses there as well. Like their dresses are amazing. I haven't shopped at Spell yet, but Spell is also really beautiful and I've always wanted to buy from there, but they've been out of my price range. Wear a lot of overalls from Lucy and Yak. I have also got a new fascination with Souk workwear. Beautiful workwear. Got a question about the big account. Has it been installed? What's going on with that? Uh, why are you using that? Um, hurry up. I want to use it. It's sitting here just annoying and tempting me to use it, but it's not ready to be used yet. I have a kiln guy that is going to come out and fix this up. He did come out already earlier at the start of the year. Put new elements in this guy, got this guy all back up to speed uh, because we lost the hinge. Uh, we lost this guy, but he's back on. This kiln is getting installed soon. I really wanted to keep the kiln systems consistent. So I'm actually getting one of these controllers installed on this guy so that it's the same for both kilns, how we set it and how we control it. It'll just be how we pack it that changes. So this is a manual controller that's on it now. I think it needs new elements as well, but this just needs to be fixed up with the thermocoop and everything that matches that controller. The kiln guy has not come back yet. So yeah, it's, it's getting there. I'm going to unload the kiln and answer a few more questions. I think there's about five more to go. Would you ever consider making your own glazes? I would love to. I just have not had the time to spend experimenting, developing, finding materials, finding recipes, all of that. But overall, I would adore to do that. I currently buy commercially pre-made stuff because that's, it's reliable, it's consistent, it works. And because a lot of my work is actually typically underglazed work, it hasn't been a top priority. And can we please not shame people for using commercially bought stuff? There's a reason why it's commercial. It's because it works. It's consistent. It is great. It is reliable. And you can do so much with it. We've got some pretty good goodies in here, actually. So this is a gold model set that we're getting ready for. Where are we going to take that? We might take it to Craft Lab. 
might take it to the event. I nearly said what it was. What's a glazing technique you've always wanted to try? Um, my gosh, there are so many. I still have only scratched the surface with techniques that I want to try and I always use the mystery molds as a really good piece to try them on. If there's two things I have wanted to try, which I might try and do in this mystery mold series, is underglaze transfers where it's like a pre-printed sheet of pattern and it transfers onto the pottery and the other one is decals so that transfers onto the pottery after it's been fired and almost like print images directly onto the pottery but that's an additional firing at the end and I've actually never done decals before but I would love to so those are two main techniques there's some other techniques I want to try that are not to do with glazing they're more to do with the clay and the application of the clay and I'd love to try a bit more of like slip trailing, which is where you trail the wet slip on the pottery and it creates like this textured element. What is the funkiest glaze you've ever used? There's actually one that I just got from Ritual Glazes, which is a new glaze business in the US. And they make glazes that crawl and bubble on the potteries. Actually, I've done a test piece, let me get it. This is the test piece. I was testing the thickness to figure out how thick I should apply it on the other pieces. So I actually got it to put on these frogs and so far it is living up to the hype. It is crawling and giving it cracks and making it look like a textured wild frog. That's why you sent them and what, what's the deal with that? Kiln shelves look like this, but then you put this stuff, see how it's a different color and it's got like a layer on it. Uh, you put this kiln wash on it so that if the glaze droops or if there's a bit of glaze on the bottom, it will come off the shelf. Otherwise, you have to grind it off and you could lose your shelf and they're quite expensive. Sometimes when you put it on this, some of this comes off with the piece if there's been glaze there. So you sand the piece to get rid of any of the kiln wash off the bottom, but also the pieces can be a little bit coarse. When you sand them, it just smooths them, it just smooths them off. It just feels really nice. Now I'm going to pack the kiln. How long does a piece usually take and also how many pieces can you make in one week? Those are both really tricky questions to answer because every piece is so different. If I put it all into one week, I didn't need to wait for things to dry and all of the process was just like bang, bang, bang. Pouring, I could probably pour about 30 pieces on one day and then open the molds up and clean them on the one day. I could probably underglaze the 30 pieces depending on detail in about two days by myself um, a day worth of firing getting not the time it actually takes to fire but like packing the kiln unpacking the kiln sanding glazing would be about a day and then yeah that would probably that's only four days but with that aside and also doing content for a day that's probably how much i could make is 30 pieces a week and that's on a really good week where nothing else comes up I'm not working on any other collaborations I'm not doing any other videos I'm not doing mystery molds as for the other question how long does it take to finish a piece from start to finish it does take a week uh, this golden water piece take so pouring the mold is about an hour you've got to wait for it to set for about four hours with my type of slip and my molds and my climate and then you can open it that same day usually um, in winter it's a bit longer so that's a day just to get the vessel and get it all tidied and cleaned up as for the underglazing, that would probably take me two to four hours depending on how detailed it was and then it would have to go in the kiln which takes about 15 to half an hour to pack so that's probably day two and then i'd have to get it out and glaze it which would probably take me about 15 minutes per piece but i usually get a big blot and just do it within a couple of hours so four hours or so, so yeah. And then I pack the kiln again, 15 minutes, and then unpack it, so maybe three days. <laughs> oh, is that me? It's my math, nothing. I don't know, but it, it takes a while, okay? It's a really long time. I get comments about my pricing all the time. Usually these are from people that don't understand the, what goes into the artwork and what, what processes and materials and all the costs of running a small business. They just don't understand that. The way I explain it to people is this is not a mug. <laughs> This is an artwork. You're purchasing someone's business skill development, growth materials and continue allowing them to continue doing what they're doing. And so when you're buying this, it's like you're buying a painting to go on the wall, a very glamorous, beautiful, darling, one of a kind painting, uh, but you get to use it every day and you get to have your morning coffee out of it. And I think it's just, why would you wanna have your morning coffee any other way, in my opinion? 
My last and final announcement for this video is relating to this question. <laughs> Do you ever sell in markets or events? So I mentioned earlier in the video, I will be attending Craft Lab at the end of May. I've been so, so lucky and had my application approved for a certain event. And this event for me has been a huge career goal. A lot of small businesses in Victoria or even Australia as a whole have this certain event as a career goal and are like, woo, I did it when you get in. I am attending my very first Finders Keepers Market. Ah! So this is, this is probably not as exciting for people that are international that are watching this, but it is really exciting for those that live in Victoria. I'm attending the Finders Keepers AW 2023 Market in Nam, Melbourne, and I am so excited. It's in the first weekend of July. I'll put the details everything of everything in this video in the caption, but it is a three-day event. I will be there for the whole weekend, selling goodies to you and getting to say hello and come up and get photos, and I've never been accepted before. And I was talking earlier about being rejected from markets. I always got rejected from this one. And I finally thought, the, this year's the year. I'm gonna apply one more time and I finally got in. I wanted to let you know because I'd love to see you there. I'd love you to say hello. As for the rest of May for YouTube, because I'm not starting the mystery moles until the start of June, I am actually vlogging the weeks leading up to Finders and Craft Lab and how I'm preparing for it, how much works I'm making and sort of just like the organization and everything that's happening in the studio to get ready for that. The mystery moles I reveal in June, plus some extras for the following month, will come with me to Finders Keepers. So that will be your first chance to get the first mystery molds of the second series of the mystery mold series. But whatever doesn't sell at the market will come back with me and I'll have a big online restock for all my interstate and international friends that are watching. I wanted to say a massive thank you so much for your continuous support, your comments, your engagement, your love, your kindness, and all your questions were so, so lovely and so thoughtful. I hope the answers were somewhat helpful to you because that's why I wanted to do it. Let me know if you would like to do another one of these at some point. But yeah, thank you for watching. Mwah!